Welcome to the Atlantic Council. My name is uh, Peter Schechter. I'm the director of the Adrian Arsch Latin America Center, and we're so glad that you can join us here for a very lively discussion, an interesting discussion on social innovation in Latin America. I'd like to give a warm welcome to our panelists, and thank you very much to all of you, Alberto, Wilfredo, Susana, and to our moderator, uh, who I will introduce in a second. Look, the core of our mission at the Adrian Arsch Latin America Center is to show that Latin America is no longer about Washington's favorite subjects, transnational crime, terrorism, corruption, violence, and drugs. The region is also about trends that are real game changers, and social innovation is one we're watching very carefully because it's able to transform how decision makers confront societies biggest challenges, such as battling corruption, opening access to education, and reducing inequality. We also think social impact investing is important for its ability to offer alternatives to the policy community. This has been one of the things that has interested me most personally, is what, what lessons does social impact investment have to the policy communities? Alternatives that shift development away from traditional models that have proven in many cases unsustainable. We think there's a lot to say about the importance of supporting innovators, not only because they do good, not only because they create jobs, not only because they make money, but because they also have the potential to create systemic change. Though Latin America is behind the curve in the generation of new technologies and products, the trend lines show a rapid increase in the presence of social impact investment. 19% of the total amount of global funds are put to work in Latin America. That means there are important people around the world that believe that social investing is key to unlocking the region's potentials. After all, great ideas without funding are little more than hallucinations. In the past months, we've had the pleasure of collaborating with our senior non-resident fellow, Gabriel Sini, who's led our work on social impact investment and social impact. Gabriel will moderate today's panel, and in addition to the work he's done with us, Gabriel is the author of Educación 2.0, and he himself is a social innovator in his role as the founder and president of Cuepa.com. We started this initiative with a series of setting the agenda roundtables, and Susana was the first one almost a year ago. Uh, with influencers in the space and began to create a core community of engagement. We've been surprised and really pleased with the interest. Our objective was to help create a movement that forces policy traditionalists to rethink this space. And to those in government or in multilateral agencies who said that the Atlantic Council was embarked on a lark that is just a passing fad, I ask you to look around this room. There's 200 people. If this is what a lark is called, I'll take it any day of the week. So to discuss this and more, we have a panel with real expertise. And before turning over to Gabriel to introduce the panel, I'd like to invite Howard Feynman, the Huffington Post's global editorial director, to say a few words. The Huffington Post has been a leader of innovation in digital news. In August, they reached an impressive 115 million global unique visitors and are a key platform for new voices like those driving social innovation to share their stories with all of us. The Huffington Post, importantly, is also dedicated to embracing the Spanish and Portuguese speaking community through the Huffington Voices Vertical and most recently through the launch of the, their ninth global edition, O Brasil Post, in January. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Howard Feynman. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. I'll be mercifully brief. Uh, we're glad to help sponsor this event. Uh, and uh, here's why we're doing it and why I'm here. Uh, the Huffington Post is now a, a global news operation. We're one of the largest in the world. Uh, depending on which uh, measurement you might use, we're the second or third largest provider of news uh, on, on, on the web, digitally, in the world. We now have 13 international editions, the most recent of which has just launched this week in Australia. 
uh, as Peter said, we have one in um, in uh, in Brazil, and we're just beginning in Latin America as well. But that's only one reason, and really, in a sense, not the main reason why I'm here. Uh, Ariana Huffington's uh, insight in 2005, when she invented the Huffington Post and launched it, was to combine social media and news, community and news. Uh, nobody had really done that before. It now seems elemental, but in 2005, it was it was startling. Uh, as you know, if you look at the site, we have a rich comment section, rich interaction, 80,000 bloggers worldwide who contribute to the Huffington Post. We've always been about community as well as news. And that's why we're here. We have a responsibility to think not only globally, but to think socially, and not only socially, but constructively. Uh, we've launched under Ariana's leadership a, a new theme, really, but one that goes back to the very beginning of the Huffington Post, which is to try to focus on, amplify, and distribute globally ideas and examples and stories about what's working in society. Uh, Lord knows there's all too much news. Uh, we're flooded with it. We're depressed by it. We're immobilized by uh, the bad news about discord and danger in the world. But there's another story, and there's another story in, in Latin America. I know a little bit about it, because I spent a fair amount of time in Argentina. I see that great country with great possibilities. As just one example in Buenos Aires of, of people thinking creatively and trying to break through uh, ossified systems, shall we say, uh, to get things done. I think that's what this is all about, that's what the Huffington Post is all about, and that's why I'm here. Uh, if I can be helpful, if the Huffington Post can be helpful in any way, as a very simple way to reach us, you can email me at Feynman, F-I-N-E-M-A-N, at Huffington Post. We have a whole section called What's Working. It's mostly focused on the United States right now, but we're going to begin to focus it through those 13 editions on all the other places we cover, and we now cover about half the planet. Tell us what you're doing that's working. Tell us what you're doing that's interesting. Show how strategic investment can multiply the good for everyone in society. Uh, that's got to be the future and the highest and best use, uh, not only of money, but of journalism. And uh, I wish you great good luck at this conference, and I'll be listening to some of the ideas that I hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Thank you so much, all of you, for being, for being here this afternoon. I think we have, as Peter said, a, a fantastic panel. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Thank you, Howard. And thank you, Peter, for your leadership. One, one year uh, uh, ago, you, you let us start this, this space at the Atlantic Council, and you, you led this, this space at the Atlantic Council, and I think in, in Washington an opportunity, a space to discuss social impact investment and public policy that no one was doing before, before you, you started this. So thank you so much for that. And as, as, as Peter said, we have been working for the last year in trying to convene and gather a group of people like you that are here in Washington and, and see uh, that Latin America need new ways to, to address the social challenges that, that we still have in, in, in the region. We are coming out in two weeks with a paper trying to address some of these problems, trying to address how in Latin America we have been growing the last 10, 15 years in many countries in a very solid way. Economic growth has been between 5 and, and, and 7%. Uh, many of the social indicators are improving. You see poverty going down in many countries. You see 70 million people joining the middle class for the first time in many years in, in Latin America. You see access to education improving, access to health improving. But we uh, think, and we, we are analyzing this paper, that what is coming uh, next is going to be much more challenging because we still have the social challenges, we still have 5 7% of Latin Americans living under $1.5 a, a, a day. We still have problems in quality of health, quality of, of education. And we 
estimate that the economy, or the economists estimate that the economic growth will be much slower than has been in the last 10, 15 years. So we, we think here at the Atlantic Council, and you will see, uh, I think, during this discussion, that social impact investment could be a, a good way, a good strategy, a good tool, whoever you want to call it, we will discuss that, that today, to tackle some of these, these challenges. This combination of the private sector, entrepreneurs looking for an economic return and a social impact and a social return could be a very good way to, to address the social challenges that we are still facing in Latin America. And for that, we brought you today an outstanding panel, uh, repres uh, three representatives of, of, of pioneers of social impact investment in, in Latin America from three different sectors, which I think are the sectors that, uh, that you know, that entail or they are uh, putting together this ecosystem of social impact investment in, in Latin America. We have Susana uh, Garcia Robles, who has been pioneering these, these issues uh, from the multilateral investment from, uh, fund from the Inter-American Development Bank. For the last 15 years, she helped to create more than 60 uh, funds, social impact investment funds in, in Latin America, in different industries, in different, different topics, different entrepreneurs. We have Alberto um, uh, Beck on, on my left. Alberto uh, has been and is a very successful, sorry, I'm telling, saying that, Alberto, very successful investor and business leader in in Latin America, and in the last years, he started to look at social impact investment as a way to, to invest in the region, but also as a way to make a difference and try to bring some of those solutions and innovations that social issues need in, in Latin America. And not happy with that, he created the Social uh, Impact and Innovation Center at, at, at Georgetown, the Beck Social Impact and Innovation Center at Georgetown, to analyze these topics and these challenges all over the world, not only in, in Latin America. Alberto is originally from, from Peru. And we have uh, Wilfredo Fernandez as well, an, an, an entrepreneur who, after some years working at Teach for America here in Washington, even though he's from Miami, lives in Miami, he realized that uh, a way to, to give back to society and a way to, to make a living, but also to have impact and, and try to change the world or change at least the, the community where he is, was getting involved in social impact investment. He created the Innovation Lab where more than 100 entrepreneurs are already working and being accelerated by, by the work of Wilfredo and, and his team in, in Miami. With that, with that introduction, I want to go directly to the, to the questions. We will have a conversation around half an hour, 40 minutes with the panel, and then we will open up to, to questions from, from you, if that, that's, that's okay. And I want to start with you, uh, Susana. When we talk about social impact investment, uh, we talk about you know, private returns, economic returns, we talk about the, the markets. W what is the role of the Inter-American Development Bank on that? W why isn't uh, Alberto San Guifredo dealing with this? Why the bank has to be... Uh, getting involved in this? Well, first of all, uh, we agree that we are going to disagree. We are making it really jazzy, fireside chat, so get ready. We are not going to agree here. Um, I think if you ask me, I would say that uh, the multilaterals, for better or for worse, we were the ones that were the first social impact investors. But what happened? Because our message was coming from governments and from the multilateral side, somehow the private sector looked at us and said, well, of course you have to say that. You are the IDB, you are the MIF. So something very interesting happened when JP Morgan and Rockefeller and other foundations began to invent social impact investment as an asset class. I have to say that on that day, my feelings were a little bit I, I had conflicting feelings because I was like, oh, really? Oh, okay. So notice they as the invention of the impact investment uh, class as a different asset class. So what I've been doing for the last 10 years at the time, nothing. But immediately I said, this is very good. This is the leg that we were missing. We do have to work together, private and public sectors, given the same message. For me, the message that we are trying to give and the different windows of the private and the public sector and the IDB and the multilateral investment fund is part of the IDB. And I cannot say too many heresies because I, I know I have there are enough IDB people there that I'll get in trouble. Is that, first of all, there are 
for us, when we look, we did an impact investing tagging exercise saying, well, okay, let's see. <coughs> Our loans, our equity investments, our technical assistance grants, have they really improved and bettered the populations of Latin America? And we realized that to a certain degree, all of them can be put under a very broad scope. But when you're talking specifically the way we talk today about impact investing, we would say a 70%, a 60% of our projects fall into that. What does that mean? That directly we are either lending or investing in services or products that can help the lives of the base of the pyramid population. But then the next scale is also attending to something that you mentioned, which is vulnerable populations. Because the region is much better, we have had an increase in middle class, but there is a vulnerable side of that middle class, the ones that went from being from the base of the pyramid to the middle class, but they still are not really inserted in the communities. They lack education, as you well know. Uh, they lack access to services and to financial mobility. So if we don't provide to them, what will happen is that maybe in 10 years, they will go back to being base of the pyramid. So I would say that's why we feel at the IDB that we have a message that now resonates across, across the board, public and private. Thank you. Alberto, going back to, why, why you got uh, involved in this? You were in the private sector, you were running different businesses. Why, why you thought that social impact investment or getting involved here, and, and, and tell us a little bit about the back center as well. Why, why, what was the reason you founded that? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, when Gabriel called me, he said, well, could you come and talk to a small group of friends, uh, fireside <laughs> chat? I don't see a fireplace, friends, and I no? see a lot of friends, friends here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, two questions. Uh, why, why, uh, why impact investment? Why the social sector? Um, uh, I think uh, it's sort of a family tradition. I mean, I've seen the, uh, uh, I've sort of inherited the, uh, this, this sense of, uh, of service. Um, and uh, my father, for example, uh, uh, he spent <coughs> the uh, uh, later years of, of his life uh, devoted to education. Uh, he created, uh, he conceptualized and, and with an uncle of mine created uh, the largest, what is today the largest technical institute in the country, TechSoup. Um, so I, I've lifted at home, and, and also my wife is here, Olga Maria is here. Um, we, we, uh, we live it also as a family. We feel that it's important to have uh, an impact in the world. And um, in 2008, I had a liquidity event. I sold uh, a stake in the company that I had, and I made a life decision that I want to spend at least half of my time in social impact activities and half of my time in in business activities and why that balance? Because I struggled with that balance, whether I wanted to spend 100% of my time in the social sector or 100% of my time in the business sector. And I felt that, um, um, as a matter of fact, uh, my brother-in-law, who is the head of the uh, Corporación del Bit, uh, he was, was our, our guide in, this, in the social sector. Um, <laughs> and um, he tried to pull me 100% into the social sector, but. Uh, I felt that there was a, a there's a great synergy between being on both sides, because you, each each side validates each other. Uh, there's a lot of synergies. There's a credibility uh, 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 on both sides if you are operating on both sides. I like to do deals as well, um, so so I stay with that. And I felt that in terms of impact investing, that that's something that really attracted me because. Um, I am a believer that in order to, to have uh, exponential impact, you need the profit component. You do. Um, I think that if you are in the social sector, you have to provide a return. Then you qualify what is the return, from ego return to uh, feel good return to um, brand uh, image uh, return. Whatever return you're providing, you need to provide a return. Um, in order to scale, you need to have a profit component. Um, and, and I think uh, we were, were discussing it's important 
that we define also what impact investing is all about, because there's a lot of uh, discussion on what is impact investing. Uh, what I can tell you is that impact, what, what impact investing is not is socially responsible investment. Um, and there's a, there, the numbers are, are thrown out there, the socially responsible investment, $13.5 trillion of the, you know, take all the financial investments in the U.S., over 200 and what, 230 trillion or whatever. But impact investing is only, what, 50 billion yeah. right now? Um, the expectation is that it, it, it will grow quite a lot. So what is impact investing? <laughs> the process is the same, the outcomes are different in the sense that if you have a normal business, you have a process and two outcomes, financial and risk. Here you're adding one or two additional outcomes, which are social impact or, and or environmental impact. And then there's a question of how, what is your priority? You know, is, is your priority the impact or your priority financial? And, and there's a lot of argument and a lot of discussion around, around that. But, and that's um, what you're looking at, uh, doing at the Beck Center? That's the kind of things you are? The Beck Center, um, by the way, yesterday was a, a one-year anniversary. I think Sonal spoke here, no? Yes. So, yeah. 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 She's just unbelievable, by the way. Um, Beck Center, what we're doing is, is three legs, um, educating, convening for action, and um, driving thought leadership. So educating students, leaders, uh, sorry, faculty and global leaders on the new trends of impact in the social sector. Um, educating for, ac for action and, and driving thought leadership. And, and, and the two big themes, and we're going to add probably a third theme uh, when we have the capacity and time. Uh, one is impact investing. The other one is pay for success, which is very linked to impact investing. And in uh, and, and, and a sector that we're we really want to get into uh, is uh, how technology can uh, serve the social sector. Um, and, and we have uh, one of the founders of uh, Singularity University that is Singularity University that is joining the board of the, of the center. So we're very excited about that as well. So Thank you. I Thank went you. on too, too long. Thanks. You know, we will go back to, to yeah. that. But uh, this ecosystem cannot work with new entrepreneurs, with new ideas, as how I was saying, with new uh, innovations. T tell us what you're doing at the Innovation Lab uh, with Fredo. And, and, and more perhaps explain, because many, many of the people here are, 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 are your age and are probably, I mean, probably deciding <coughs> what they will do with their lives and how they can impact Latin America. How did you go from, from Teach for America in Washington, D.C. Sure. To, to running and founding the, the Innovation Lab? Sure. So in Washington, D.C., I taught at Friendship <coughs> Public Charter School. And one of our backers was an organization called Venture Philanthropy Partners. And these were former venture capitalists that have you know, <coughs> changed their mission in, in some sort of way and brought that process of venture capital investment but brought it into investing in education. And that kind of just started get, getting my mind going. And I thought, OK, Miami doesn't have any think tanks, uh, doesn't have any places where new ideas are being uh, created or, or convened. And we have a lot of huge social challenges. So how do you get the right people around challenges in the environment with sea level rise and poverty in education, us having the fourth largest school district? Um, and how do you create the support system for social innovators? And that's what the lab became, was this place where social innovators worked, where they got mentorship, access to capital, uh, access to like-minded people, forward-thinking people, kind of your tribe. And, and that was the idea, is to create that space that then served as a catalyst for a lot of different conversations in the city. Um, and of that have come a bunch of different social ventures, um, among them a fund that invests in startups that are solving urban challenges. So startups that are creating technologies that are solving urban challenges, but not necessarily technologies that they sell to government, but direct to you. Uh, you know, for example, Uber is a huge um, company that has tremendous social impact in the way it's redefining transit and moving people around in the space of mobility. Uh, but you know, we consume it, governments don't. And so that fund focuses on, on finding those startups, giving them su support, because they require a different type of know-how, a different type of network. 
at the end of the day, social innovators are, are solving systemic problems. And these are very complex that involve you know, the work of institutions, of investors, of nonprofits alike, and, and a cadre of different types of leaders. Um, but where do you find those and how do you, how do you connect those people? And that's, that's what the lab does on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, thank you. And as Peter was saying, Susana, we are interested here in see how this is impacting uh, public policy. And, and after you know, founding or starting up more than 60 uh, funds, do, do you see that governments in Latin America start to look at this as a, not as a way to imitate, but at least as a way to get ideas or to, as Alberto was saying before, to scale up ideas that perhaps are working but are not being massive? Is it, is it happening in Latin America? Is these new funds like INADEM in Mexico, Corfo in Chile, or Impulsa in Colombia, is that something that is a positive trend? Or how do you see the impact on public policy? In well, I definitely Latin? think it is a positive trend. Um, I work on and off with Professor uh, Josh Lerner of uh, Harvard University. And when I first met him, you know, he's famous for having written several books talking about what governments do wrong building the venture capital industry. So I approached him and I said, OK, but I need you to focus on the role of governments supporting entrepreneurship and venture capital and investments in Latin America. Because even though everybody will make mistakes at some point, <coughs> I don't think we would have an industry without those government agencies. So of course, I began to give him uh, assignments and papers to write and panels to, to moderate. And today, he knows more about it. I think they are important because you do need uh, to understand that the private sector doesn't necessarily have to take the huge risk of building an ecosystem. That belongs, in my view, um, we start up with governments and multilaterals. And when we begin to have some demonstration effect, it will be more natural for the private sector to come in. Now, what is happening, and I'm so happy to see it, is that more and more there are banks and other companies that are pitching in earlier on. And I give you an example. Um, I've been working with my team in Jamaica for two years. And they really, the first time I went, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Kingston, but you know, it's, it's a city like many cities in, in the Caribbean and Latin America that doesn't strike you because of the beauty. But I fell in love with the people there because they were trying to come up with the startup Jamaica, with accelerators. Um, the Branson Center is in there, of course, not in Kingston, in Montego Bay. I didn't get to that. I just went to Kingston. So a year later, you know, a year ago, the, the Minister of uh, Finance was saying, we are going to start the startup Jamaica. I was a little bit mad because I knew he hadn't told me we don't have a penny. So I said, well, you know, Startup Chile started with money. So if you don't have money, why are you doing the Startup Jamaica? So we kept in touch. And a year later, I went last September. And Startup Jamaica had a wonderful, wonderful place full of entrepreneurs. Because two banks <coughs> and a technology company said, OK, the government doesn't have the money. We'll put up all the, the infrastructure you guys need to get together and convene. And in Brazil, we have seen, too, that when you begin to have you know, some demonstration effect, Brazilians didn't like to think that they, they were a huge market for impact investment. Actually, I tried to work with the US government in trying to create a task force between Brazilians and Americans, and basically, because I speak Portuguese, and I've been there since 1999, five times a year, so they know me very well. They were like, why, why is the US government trying to tell us that we need this? We, we, no, we, we have some people who are poor, but that's temporary. We don't need this. So we invested in an impact <coughs> investment fund, Box Capital, and began to you know, to, this guy is really a thought leader, and began to convene foundations, the government, everybody. And then last year, we had the first impact investment conference there. And I went because I'm an investor in the fund. But I didn't expect too many people. I found 500 people who were really serious about that. 
They were not people just shopping around and saying, oh, what is this? No, they were people that were creating a task force between the government and the private sector to analyze, okay, how can we organize this? How can we do investments, but also what else is needed to support these entrepreneurs? I love your definition. I've been saying it, so I feel like, oh, yay. Uh, the innov innovators of today usually are people who are very frustrated with something that is going on in their communities, and they have the tools, and they look for other people, and together they solve a problem. Sometimes are women who have disabled kids, and so they begin to look for a solution to make the lives of their kids more you know, conducive to a normal life. Uh, whether it is traffic or education or, you know, I get into a website and I don't understand how to navigate to get to the doctor I need that my medical insurance pays for. Uh, there are a lot of companies, startups, and beginning to grow that are surfacing. So the governments are taking notice. Um, today, I was talking to Corfo in Chile. We are trying to put together our thoughts to promote a social innovation fund. Uh, trying to, you know, to, to say, okay, Chile is doing much better in innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, but now <coughs> let's focus on outside Santiago, what are the problems? You know, let's get the, the issues outside. And uh, the last thing I want to say, Ruta N in Medellin, Colombia, I don't know if there are Colombians here, but that's a great way of how the government work with the uh, private sector. They went to a neighborhood that was very bad. The first time I had to go to Ruta N, I was with another young woman from the MIF, and I told the, the taxi driver the address, and he looked at me and said, no, you don't want to go there. I said, well, no, I, I want to go there because I have a meeting and I'm running late. Are you sure, senorita? And I said, yes, don't worry, I can take care of myself. And what happened? The government allowed this huge complex, Ruta N, that works as an accelerator, incubator, and many other things, to, to create a, an infrastructure so entrepreneurs could go there and could be incubated, and they could also do a lot of exchanges. So I, you know, those are the initiatives that maybe when I started doing this in 1999, we didn't have. So it's a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And, and in the last, I think, years in Latin America, there are uh, I think that many more networks or ecosystem conferences were, were developed. Uh, you know, it looks like you have an opportunity to go to one of these private equity networks or, or conference once a week in, in, in Latin America. And Alberto, how, how do you see, uh, you said that half of your time is in the private sector, private sector. How do you see your fellow uh, business leaders looking at this in Latin America? Do, because there's a lot... We always complain that the governments are not delivering services, they're spending too much, there's corruption in Latin America, but, but now there are many ways to, to make a difference without you know, going through, through the, 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 the government. You see a, a trend in your in, in business leaders or investors, private investors in the region, to go to the sector, or, or is it still very much multilaterals and governments pushing for, for no, this? No, I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's a generational <laughs> issue and it's an educational issue. Um, what do I mean by that? First, uh, look at the audience. I mean, most of, most of the audience is young, uh, or I, uh, I guess we're too old, but anyhow. Uh, but uh, that's consistent with, um, uh, with the interest. Uh, when you look at the millennials uh, in Latin America, they are much more interested, much more engaged, much more interested in, 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 in doing good and get involved in, in, in proactive um, uh, <coughs> social impact. <coughs> it's educational because uh, for, for the business leaders of today, which are not the millennials yet, um, they are intrigued, but they don't understand it. They're accustomed to charity, they're accustomed to uh, non-for-profit organizations. I hate the word non-for-profit, by the way, mm -hmm. or NGOs. I, I keep saying it whenever I have a chance. Please don't mention that word mm -hmm. because uh, if you're a non-for-profit, define yourself in terms of what is the impact that you're having. 
Uh, the, the, that sector is the only sector that defines itself in terms of what it doesn't do. It's like being in business and saying, I don't do marketing, or I don't do this, or I don't do that. That's the way I'm defining myself. So I think that we have to redefine ourselves and defining ourselves in terms of what is the impact that we're having. But going back to, and I'll, I'll give you a specific case. I'm, I'm involved in a company called Lumni, which I got involved as, uh, as a mentor. Actually, my wife and I um, would have breakfast every week with Felipe Vergara from Colombia. He's an Ashoka fellow and, uh, and an Endeavor fellow. And he would come and we would mentor him <laughs> because we're part of the Ashoka Support Network. I don't know if he was looking for a mentorship or a free breakfast, but anyhow, <laughs> he would come every, every, every week. And, um, and that evolved into, into uh, us investing in Lumni, and now I'm the chairman of Lumni, so I'm, I'm really involved with Lumni. Um, and, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit about Lumni, and then I'll, yep. I'll answer your question because it's, it's, it's related. What, what Lumni is is um, a company that invests in human capital. Okay, that's a fancy uh, description. The, the real description is private equity on people. So what do I mean by that? Um, we go to uh, students that are um, in Latin America, are going to university, and we pay for their uh, university studies in exchange for a percentage of, the comp of, of their compensation once they finish school. So we, we take the risk. No guarantees. So there are students that could tell us that they want to be engineers, and then we do the algorithm, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the study, and then we decide, uh, well, that's, that's a type of risk, because if he is or she is going to um, uh, this university and studying this um, career, then the expectation is that he's, he or she is going to make so much money, and then you, you run the numbers, and then you, you decide how you are going to invest in the individual. Um, so it's private equity on people. <coughs> uh, when we, Lumni today is in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile. Uh, 7,000 students have gone through Lumni's network. We've raised a total of about $50 million uh, to finance the students. And now the uh, challenge for Lumni is to go to, a, to the next level to get into the institutional markets. Uh, how did we start? Because that's very much linked to, to your question. We started with, the, um, with a heart. I invested, we invested with a heart. Big mistake. <laughs> because then we, um, after, after a while I, I was looking through the Lumni uh, papers that I had signed and that I had invested in and I said, how did I do that? Um, so then it's where I engaged my brain. And uh, then it's where I got involved with Lumni, then I became the chairman, then I helped them in, in governance, in, in risk management, in the right corporate structures and what have you. And also, uh, talking about the credibility, being a businessman in Lumni provides a lot of credibility and obviously the relationships as well. It's very important, people focus on the money. The money is the last thing. I mean, the most important thing for me, at least what I've seen is your knowledge, your time, your credibility, and uh, your relationships. And then if you add the money component, then you really have an impact in whatever you're, you're doing. But uh, in, in the case of Lumni, the first type of investors are the, 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 the hard investors, right? Yeah. The, the super angel hearts. Um, and, and, and to transition from the hearts to the brains is very important in, in, a, in, a, in a social enterprise um, because you have to start with the brains. And many, most of these enterprises start with a heart and that's, that's a problem. That's why the complaint by many investors that there are not enough um, companies to invest in because they're driven by the heart, they hire by the heart, they run it by the heart. And, and when, when you engage the brain, uh, in the case of Felipe, for example, he's a Wharton, uh, Mm -hmm. graduate in uh, McKinsey, uh, 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 he worked in McKinsey, but, but still he didn't have the expertise of running a company. Anyhow, so uh, transitioning from, from angel heart to 
a pre-VC type to VC to institutional, it's the hard part. And um, what we found in the case of Lumni, uh, that our boards, for example, are very different. We have very high level boards in, in, in Mexico, in, in Colombia, and now in Peru. We just started Peru, but the way we position it was very different. We said to the board members, if you're coming to Lumni, you're not coming to make us a favor. You're coming because you're really interested in this. And by the way, if you want to be a board member, you have to invest a million dollars in our funds. That changes completely, completely the interest. And we were able to attract. It goes down or up? The interest. <laughs> it goes up. Up? Yeah. It goes up. And the interesting thing is we, we have a who's who in Peru and in the board. We have a who's who in Mexico. But the, the, the Mexico board was a pre, the, the sort of the uh, ancient Lumi, heart, heart which is a heart <laughs> type. You know, so they are, they are committed, but they're not totally committed. But when they put a million dollars, uh, each of the board members, I tell you, their commitment <laughs> changed completely. Yeah. And they are much more interested, much more engaged. They go out, they raise funds, uh, they, they, they put their credibility on the line for the, uh, for the pension funds. Right. And, well. right. Thank you, thank you. And as uh, we feel, as, as uh, Alberto was saying, heart is not enough for, you know, the, the dream of doing good or changing Latin America is, is, is not enough. And after dealing with more than, than 100 entrepreneurs, wh what are the three, two or three characteristics that you can share with, with the audience uh, that, that makes a, uh, an entrepreneur that probably all of us have ideas about that, but, but what are the two or three things that if you find them, you, you know that this entrepreneur will, will fight until he or she make it happen, and if you don't, you think that probably Susana and Alberto know this from an investment point of view, but how do you see it dealing with entrepreneurs in, in Miami? Sure. What are the four or five uh, talents, values, characteristics? that? Sure, one is, is a relentlessness to pursue viability and the impact and, and kind of tan, but first the viability. Uh, they have to be passionate about profit, you know, and I see this in, in the entrepreneurs, but also I, I work <coughs> with students and students that come and say, I want to start a nonprofit. I say, no, what's the problem that you want to solve? So it, it's that passion. Um, you know, after that, it's, it's resourcefulness, it's asset based thinking, it's, you know, being able to marshal resources. It's that scrappiness, it's that resilience. I know that's more than three, but you know, it's the characteristic of, of any entrepreneur that you are, that someone has entrusted you with their hard earned money and you are dedicated and committed to giving that back and then some. And then you can think about the impact. So it's much more about character than about academic skills. skills. Absolutely. It's I studied not... political science and had a, a master's in education. Right. Um, you know, I didn't have any formal business training, but. You know, my competitiveness and my, my resilience and relentlessness is what, you know, achieves the results. Right, right. Can, can Susana and Alberto add uh, to, to that question as well? And then we open to the, to the public. When you look at, at invest, uh, at, 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 at the entrepreneurs or the people that are, at Felipe's that you are considering to invest, what are the two or three things in addition to what, uh, or in opposite to what Gifredo is, is saying that you look at? No, I, I brief, want so a, we open it to the, to a the problem solver. I don't want a person who is going to get totally back down at the first problem. An entrepreneur has that resilience that is almost exciting. There is a problem. There is a challenge. Yay! I'm going to overcome it. I, I look <coughs> for the right partner. So I look for an entrepreneur that is not a solo player. I look for an entrepreneur that has a team because he recognizes that it will be very good that at some point somebody else will say, I totally disagree. How can make this work? Very important. And I also think that most of the entrepreneurs have been exposed to different uh, environments that they had a glimpse of what they could do if they would only have the means, whether uh, it was because they went and studied overseas or work overseas or went to another state that was more developed. And they got back to their communities thinking, now I know how to do it and who I'm going to associate with in order to make it happen. Alberto? In my case, um, I, I, I see entrepreneurs both on the uh, social side and on the uh, on the business side, I'm, I'm in the board of Endeavor Miami as well. So I've seen how 
how that has developed in, 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 in the case of Miami, but also I've seen uh, social entrepreneurs. As an investor also, I don't invest in ideas, I invest in people. And, and I've passed on a lot of great ideas that you, I, I would share it with any of, I would share any of these ideas with you and you would fall in love with them. Mm -hmm. And I would just pass because I would say the, the, the person is not the right person. And, and to me, it's that passion, that, that, that drive, that it's that person that is so convinced about what he or she is doing that they will go through walls. And, and, and they have, uh, th those type of uh, entrepreneurs have, have a very good marketing ability as well. Because obviously, if, if you don't have a marketing ability, you won't be able to go through the door. Um, because if you got through the door, well, you need money, and you need this, and you need that, and you, you have to hustle. And, and for that, you need to be able to, to, uh, to be a good salesman at, right. at, at, at the same time. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I want to open now the, the, the discussion to the public. You have a, the first, we have a microphone or how, yeah, does it work? Can you identify yourself and where you? Hi, I'm Alexis. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you for this amazing panel. I'd like to pick up on Susana's reflections about the public policy realm. You uh, explained uh, very well these, these cases in Jamaica and also in Medellin. And I'm concerned about uh, what would be the right policies or, or what's the right uh, public policy realm in order to uh, foster social impactful innovation like the cases that, that you have you have discussed. So perhaps to, to the entrepreneurs in, in the panel, uh, what are you looking for in the cities where you have decided to invest? Uh, Alberto, you have chosen places to, to do the investment. Uh, also Wilfredo, you're working in, in a specific place. So uh, what would make a, a city or, or an environment more competitive for attracting, for attracting this type of social impactful innovation? Thank you. Thank you. If there is something I learned um, when I started doing this in 1999, um, I used to say in the myth we were young, naive, and rich. <laughs> so now we have less resources because we have allocated quite a bit of our resources. We definitely are not naive, and some of us are definitely less young. So <laughs> um, I think you do need an ecosystem, and that's why you know, I'm nodding at everything he's saying because that was our first mistake, to think that something isolated, whether it is an idea without a team behind, as Alberto was saying, or a fund or a company in the midst of a vacuum can work. No, you have to begin to work in places where there is at least the minimum interest of an ecosystem in which the entrepreneur that usually being an entrepreneur is accepting that you are gonna feel lonely many times in your journey, even if you have a team. You're gonna feel lonely because you're bootstrapping, you don't have enough money, uh, nobody's coming knocking at your door saying, yes, we want to invest in your uh, company or startup. So you do need to have some support system, but it has to be sophisticated. It can be just, um, as somebody who we know, Ariel Arrieta says, it can be your mommy telling you, oh, your idea is great, your company is going to succeed. Well, of course your mother is going to say that, hopefully, but you need somebody who is from outside that comfort zone saying, I believe in you, I'm going to look at it, maybe I won't agree with everything you're doing, but we'll help you. And for that you need, in a way, ecosystems that are, at least are beginning to develop entrepreneurs that are successful, begin to be angel investors, begin to give back to the community, something that Endeavor, which is an organization that we invested a lot, bringing Endeavor to all the Latin American places, believe very hard, you know? You cannot be an Endeavor entrepreneur if you don't give back to the community because you went the full circle. So now you have to recognize the other mini-me's and say, okay, I totally identify myself with you 20 years ago or 25 years ago. So um, the good news for me is that before, if somebody were to study uh, all the countries that I was going to for many years, they were the usual suspects. They were, uh, of course, Brazil, uh, Uruguay and Argentina, Chile, Colombia at some point began to be really a referent in entrepreneurship, Mexico. 
uh, Central America. Now I really feel, you know, we invested in a fund in Haiti. We are meeting Haitians who were living quite comfortably in Canada and France, and they went back to Haiti to make it happen in their countries. Uh, I go to Jamaica, two weeks ago I was in Paraguay, and my team by now laugh because I come back from those places and I'm totally, I'm writing a blog on what I've seen, and you guys, you don't know when I was with these people, and they are like, okay, okay, calm down. But now the entrepreneurial virus is much more stronger and firm up in the region, but you still, cannot be so lonely. You still need a little bit of an ecosystem in the making. Wilfredo, do you have anything to add, or Alberto? Yeah, uh, I have a lot to add. <laughs> 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 I've got to contain myself here. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when At the Board of Endeavor, we, we discuss this, uh, how, how do we promote uh, entrepreneurs in Miami? And uh, and also, in the in, when I look at social entrepreneurs, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, you need institutions that uh, are identifying, promoting, supporting entrepreneurs. You need media to help. And you need the great stories. The great stories. Uh, I mean, if you look at the ecosystem of entrepreneurs in Argentina, for example, it's basically a couple of people. Um, well, actually, in, in, in the U.S. It's, uh, as well, Fairchild Semiconductor, apparently it's a trillion, trillion, the first trillion dollar company. Why a trillion dollar company? Because most of the uh, uh, big entrepreneurs of, of today came out for, from Fairchild. Um, so, so you have those, uh, I'll give you um, something that, that we did in Colombia, for example. We, uh, uh, not related to the fund, uh, to the trust, uh, sorry, to the center, it's more related to our crazy ideas. Um, uh, one day I, I had this crazy idea that we wanted to tell the stories of social impact leaders. Um, talking to a social impact leader actually from, from Brazil, I said, well, you know, we keep talking about the business people and the, uh, and the politicians and the, uh, and the football players when, whenever they win, or the celebrities, but why, we, we don't recognize, we don't, we don't tell the good stories of the social impact leaders. So why don't why why not create a reality sh a reality show? That was my crazy idea. So I went to my wife and I said, "Well, I want to do this," and uh, she said, um, eh, "That's crazy. Eh, you are no, absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. You don't know anything about TV, um, and it's a great idea." <laughs> so, so I said, "Well, uh, you're right on the three of them." Because I'm absolutely crazy. I don't know anything about TV, but we started a production company. We we uh, we develop a, a, a for the. Uh, are there Colombians here? Okay. Have you watched Misión Impacto? Okay. Misión Impacto started here. So Misión Impacto is uh, a re docu reality um, uh, that uh, prime time 8 p.m. It's already uh, done. So we're gonna we're we're already talking about the next uh, season. But uh, it, it really highlights the, uh, the, uh, the work of these uh, social impact uh, leaders. And, and it's very interesting, the conversation that has started in, in Colombia. And I think it's important to have this, show these examples, because that's what inspires people. And, and the media is very important to, to show that. And also institutions like the BID, uh, IDB, sorry, and like the other institutions and they were and, and, and what have you that are supporting uh, this type of uh, entrepreneurs. And for that, Governments that can support and then take kind of an arm's distance and be there along the way in the journey because there's where they're going to see where the roadblocks are and that's where the policy interventions can come. You know, so governments that have done that well or are doing it well in Pulsa, Colombia, Startup Chile, that are there to support but at arm's length, not dictating um, and learning along the way because at the end of the day, these are also people that are investing in those, in those entrepreneurs. So there, there are these people and functionaries of, of the government that are investing in those individual entrepreneurs. And what I've found is they're former entrepreneurs as well. So they understand. And so we need more entrepreneurs also kind of moving on the other side of the table, uh, going into government and, and serving in that capacity to help innovate on that side. Yeah, question, comment? Sir? 
I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent have you been able to use the Internet to get the investors together and get consensus and get transparency? Thank you. Anyone want to? Yeah. I mean, crowdfunding is one way in which you begin to connect. Um, but there are plenty of uh, angel lists and investors networks that are totally now on the Internet. Um, we do have several platforms at the ADV. One of them is Connect Americas. And as an initiative within the IIC, the Inter-American Investment Corporation, we have included within Connect Americas, Invest Americas. So we are trying to populate those platforms with information on companies, on companies who um, are looking to export, uh, on markets, on funds, on entrepreneurs. So I think it's... I mean, more and more, that's the way to go. My experience is, uh, hasn't been that great, actually, because with, with um, Mission Impacto, what we did uh, is that we created a, a web uh, platform. Mm -hmm. So it was a cross-media uh, platform where the idea is that we will inspire you, but then we'll um, get you to act. That's, and, and the way you act is through the platform. And, and the platform, what, what we developed was a platform that, that connected the social um, organizations. Um, it was gamified in the sense that, uh, which was very innovative for Latin America, actually nobody else has done that. It's um, through a gaming platform, you learn, you get points, you mentor, you get points, you volunteer, you get points, you donate, you get points. And then you turn those points uh, for uh, something frivolous like an iPad or an experience, a social impact experience. Um, we had between a million and two million people watching the program every weekend, which was <coughs> phenomenal. Uh, but uh, it was, sorry, we joined venture with an organization called Little Big Money. And we were very surprised of the little, little money <laughs> that we got through Little Big Money for crowdfunding. It, it, the, 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 that platform was to crowdfund, crowd, crowdfund the different projects that the social entrepreneurs uh, have that were highlighted in the program. So my, my experience has been, uh, I think there's a lot of learning. There's a lot of um, um, people are, are uh, desconfiados, how do you say? Um, they, they, they don't. They don't trust it yet. Uh, I think it will develop, and um, it will be powerful, but it will take time. That, at least that's my, no, my personal experience. Yeah, I think Anything the two to main know. platforms, at least in the US, are Gust and AngelList. And that's where you're seeing investors that are investing at that level, less than a million dollars in that very early stage. Um, and that, those platforms make sure that you're an accredited investor, and, and there's that level of transparency. And now, as we see, after the Jobs Act, more equity crowdfunding platforms, that being another avenue for, for kind of verifying. Even, even the, the Jobs people. Act, I mean, it's, it's very restrictive. Um, yeah. It has to be for now. It has to be for because now, because yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Any questions in the back? Yes. Sorry. <coughs> regarding oh thank you and I have a question uh, regarding uh, I know that there are some countries in Latin America that have more experience in social uh, entrepreneurship and I wanted to know how do you think that uh, these countries can share their experience with other countries in Latin America that are just starting with this very good question um, well I think you know Alberto said something that is so true. I mean, we need to tell the stories, okay? Creating awareness is part of a big, big part of the equation, how to get going. If you don't know, you may think, I'm the only crazy one thinking this. But when you begin to find out that all over the region there are others like you, you don't feel lonely anymore. You feel connected. So uh, for us at the ADV, obviously, our mission is that. When we do something in Brazil and it works, we want to take it to other countries. When, you know, when I went to Paraguay, I talk about our experiences in Jamaica and in Uruguay because they are smaller countries. I won't talk about what happened in Brazil because there is no comparison. So you try to make the dots connect, but I think part 
of the equation has to be in every entrepreneur. Whenever I talk to entrepreneurs, I tell them, you know, you do have a responsibility to blog, to see and be seen, because others will be inspired by you. And entrepreneurship also has a lot to do with being inspired, finding uh, role models, but real role models, bone and flesh, that you can say, this guy is like me. I mean, uh, and there is where, you know, in, in a term that obviously we welcome very much at the ADB, there is a democratization of access to finance and access to, to opportunities. When it is no longer, you know, reserved for the few who are over-connected and they are just going to a small circle, but you take it out of that and anyone can get to the angel investors, can get to tell their story, and can get to meet others from no matter, you know, what social strata or economic means, but you're sharing ideas. You're not just moving in circles that never connect. Alberto, anything to you? Yeah, it, it, it's not, uh, there's enough, there isn't enough capillarity, not only in Latin America, but in the world. Uh, it, we were some years ago, in uh, two, three years ago, in Nepal, and uh, when, 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 whenever we, we, we travel, we, we try to connect with, uh, with the reality of the country and with social entrepreneurs, and, and, and we met with this amazing social entrepreneur from uh, uh, Ashoka. He's a globalizer. Um, he's one of the uh, really shining stars of Nepal, and he had come up with a delight type uh, of, uh, of invention. Uh, this is a, a light for the poor. And I was very excited. I mean, we were very excited when we met with him about this uh, um, fabulous uh, invention. And he said, well, are you taking it through the Ashoka network to the rest of the, of the under the olive world? And he said, well, no. <laughs> and uh, I, we were very frustrated. But through Mission Impacto, we'll take it to other, other, <laughs> other countries. <laughs> uh, after Colombia, um, He can watch it in Chile now. We're gonna, can um, he watch it in Chile? No, Not but uh, well, actually what we're doing, for those of you that are dying to, to watch Mission Impacto, uh, what we're doing is that we're giving it away to the rest of uh, Latin America, with the exception of Mexico, because in Mexico we'll do something, something different. And um, we're going to do a next uh, season. But here is an, an interesting case. Uh, we lost a lot of money on that. Both the TV, uh, RCN, which is the largest media company in Colombia, in, in us, in, in our foundation. Um, and it was interesting, the conversation with, uh, with the media company, because it was a world upside down. I, uh, when, when talking to the president of a media company, I'm coming from the social sector in this case, I was telling Gabriel, you really have to make money out of this. And he said, no, this is so great. This is the best thing. This is so important for Colombia. It's, it's a country project. That's OK if we lose money. That's OK. No, no, you have to make money. Because I want to make sure that it's done next year and that we can take it to other countries. And there has to be a, a, a value proposition, a profit proposition to the different TV companies in the different countries that we would love to take to. So um, we have changed the format. Uh, we restructure everything, and hopefully in the next season, RCN will make money, and the foundation will make money, but we'll give it in prices and, and working capital for other, for, other, uh, for other countries. So watch the space. Hopefully, Mission Impacto will come to your home. <laughs> hey, Fredo, any, anything to, to add to the question? Yeah, I think it's one of these kind of all-of-above solutions. Obviously, this is one of Ashoka's missions, is to celebrate these entrepreneurs and connect them. Um, I think... If you're a social entrepreneur, you know where the resources are and you're finding out where the conferences are, where you're going to meet all these people. Um, you know, the IDB is one of these conveners. The lab is one of these conveners. It's on the universities as well for their faculty to know where these people are, bring them into the classroom. Um, it's, you know, and the media to tell the story. So it's very exciting, you know, if, if Huffington Post can really make uh, an effort to, to celebrate social innovators uh, throughout the world. How, yeah. But can I ask a question? How many of you are, are thinking in starting up a social impact uh, company or startup? Are you, any of you involved in that? Okay. You? Can you share one second your idea? <laughs> 
30 second pitch. Ele elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> One second. I don't think I'm, I'm quite ready for that yet, but... Um, what, what's what's your name? Solution. I, my name is Paulina Valdez. Um, I graduated from American University recently and working in DC. Uh, my main idea is to try to connect different uh, aspects of an incubator, accelerator, technical assistance, and financing into a same institution that's going to be um, able to provide the aid entrepreneurs need uh, in Latin American countries, especially I'm from El Salvador, and the, the access people from very low income have to technical assistance and financing <coughs> is very scarce. To try, so to try to incorporate all that into one um, main company that's going to be uh, providing those services for the bottom of the pyramid. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, anyone else that is starting up a, a social impact a company or initiative? If not, we go to questions. Any other questions? Please. Hello, my name is Tolu Olubumi, and I'd love the panel to talk a little bit about your plan or vision for the private sector. Uh, the private sector is now very comfortable with giving to nonprofits, citizen sector, sector organizations, uh, writing checks. Um, and that's become sort of the standard way to give back. But as uh, you particular, in particular, Mr. Beck, mentioned, social entrepreneurs need more than checks. Uh, they need mentors, they need facilities, they need examples, you know, they need to be incubated in a place that is able to foster their ideas and then spread it throughout the world. Private sector organizations, particularly the global one, would be a fantastic place um, for folks to do that, taking away the, the conflicts when it comes to investments and what they choose to do and not to do with their money. But what, what do you see as the role of the private sector in this new growth of social entrepreneurs? How can they be supportive? What is the best way for them to give back beyond just writing a check? Can they be the arbiters of distributing good ideas through the world? No, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> something that really bothers me is when people um, in the private sector and the corporate sector uh, tell you about how much money they're investing in, 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 in corporate social resp mm -hmm. responsibility activities. And, um, and I tell you my experience. I, I, I had an investment in a mining company that we took public in, in London. Um, it was the first IPO, actually, of a Latin American company that went, went public in the main market in, in, in the London Stock Exchange. And I was very proud of all the uh, great work that we were doing with communities. We were really changing the lives of the communities that we were affecting. And I came in 2006 to uh, the London market, and the London market is much more long-term than the American market. So I can imagine how it might have been in, in the New York, New York Stock Exchange. And, 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 and I was very disappointed by the way the investors were just checking the box. Okay, yeah, okay, fine. And I kept, you know, I was very proud. I was very excited about what, what we had done. And uh, okay, next, let's talk about uh, how you're going to double production in the next uh, uh, five years. Um, when people tell you that they have invested, when corporates in, tell you that they have invested millions of dollars in something, disregard it completely. I think the most important thing is, so what are you doing? What is the impact that you're having with that? Measure it, show it to me. Because if somebody's investing $50 million in building buildings or statues or whatever, and somebody's investing $100,000 in really transforming the community by helping them sort their, their wool or, or disintermediating the, uh, the, uh, the intermediators um, and, and in improving the lives of these communities, I'd rather go with the, uh, with, with, with the, with the company that it's, it's really affecting these. I think it's important it, uh, that the work of, uh, of the private sector is absolutely critical. And um, one in, in, in the center, um, in the Beck Center of Social Impact and Innovation at, at Georgetown, we will start educating people on impact investing, and there's a lot of education that has to be uh, done. Um, I give you a recent example. So there's so much to talk about. That's why I'm sort of a, a recent, recent example. Um, a, a social investment bank came to us, and uh, with a with an impact investing opportunity, 
in um, a global alliance for, uh, of uh, uh, banking for values. So we took it to the family office, and the family office, which is very interested because their clients are, it's a multifamily office, uh, their clients are, are asking for this type of investments. By the way, there's a lot of demand on the investor side. Lack of ignorance, uh, a lot of ignorance, but lot, lack, lack of, uh, a lot of demand. So send it to a multifamily office. They looked at it and they said, no, this is Alberto, forget it. This is too risky. 10 to 1 leverage. I said, really? So for every dollar that we would be investing, they would leverage it 10 times. I said, that sounds strange. Let me look at the, at, at the paper. Do you know what was the uh, 10 to 1 leverage? It was social impact. Mm -hmm. So they, they completely missed it. It was because you would be investing in the real economy because these are banks that are investing the real economy through loans rather than through financial investments. They had calculated that <coughs> for every dollar, they, it was a 10, uh, talking about the multiple of impact, 10 to 1 impact. And the, and, the, and, the, and, and the multifamily office had understood that as a, as a financial leverage. So there's a lack of communication here. We need to educate those people. But finally, on the Beck Center, one of the things that we really want, the ultimate objective is to get companies to get impact into their DNA. And that is a much longer term uh, proposition, obviously. Unilever is somebody that is really um, leading the way. There was an article in the Financial Times the other day uh, complaining <laughs> about the CEO, that he's, he's thinking too long term and, and, and uh, he's thinking too much in the social sector and, uh, and not enough in, in, in short term returns. But that's the type of discussions that we're, we're going to have. Thank you. Susana, you want to add anything to this? Or we, no. we go to the last question. Yeah. Just real quick. Um, for me, it's tactical, and it, and it comes down to governance. Uh, we now have 28 states in, in the United States that have adopted legislation supporting benefit company um, formation, and this is an alternative to an LLC or to the nonprofit. This is a, the kind of hybrid that, as a decision maker, I can take into account two things with e equal weight. right? profit for my shareholder, and impact for the community, the public benefit, if you will. Um, this is somewhere where you know, Latin America is lagging, but I think it's to their advantage because they can see how this starts to play out in different states and around the country. Um, you know, in Florida, we, we just passed it last year. It's a social purpose corporation. In Louisiana, it's a social enterprise. In Delaware, it's a public benefit company. Um, but it takes an investor being open to that and saying, okay, when I give Gabriel that dollar, I know that you know, his only concern is not going to be the, that profit, but it's going to be both. You know? um, and it takes a willingness and a, and a certain mindset and ethos for that investor to be able to take, that, to take that next step. But it's also upon the law firms and the private sector to advocate and eventually lobby for that legislation. So I think that's a big thing that, that can be done. I have one second for one short question, uh, and that's... Thank you very much for the panel that you really enjoyed. Uh, I, I was thinking when I was here to Alberto about the, the business and the social the, the balance, I was thinking, okay, what is the role here of media and politics? Then in one of the questions you answered about the media, now the last question about the politics, I was thinking, like, how are the the challenge or the barriers governments make to social impact and to business also, uh, and the, the role of the government. What do you expect or what do you uh, think, because we have in Latin America particular government, particular politics institutions, so what do you expect or what do you recommend for politics? And more personal question, what do you do if you were uh, the chief of staff of a country or the minister of government of one of the Latin American countries? They say the last leg that you didn't speak yet. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> so the first one, and I'll answer the second one. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> okay. Well, I think you know governments can be a great help or a great obstacle. So they have to understand where they fall in the cycle, and he said it so well. They have to be enablers. They have to be catalyzers. But when things begin to work with the help of the private sector, 
that's the time in which governments have to take a sit back and say, okay, let's go to another area, another sector, another segment that needs to be built from scratch until the private sector comes. And that's tough, okay? I've seen many governments staying too long or trying to interfere when the ecosystem and the environment is ready for the private sector and the entrepreneurs to take on. And they, it's almost like they cannot uh, stop, you know? And I always say the same, you know? And the myth, when we started doing this, we always said, uh, the best day that they will open the champagne bottle will be when nobody in the region will knock at our doors asking us to invest in one of their funds or do a technical assistance program to foster ecosystems. So far it hasn't happened, but <laughs> that's our goal. We want to become irrelevant because the private, we have enabled and empower the private sector. So now we'll hear about the next. <laughs> the first thing that I would do is hire Susanna <laughs> to run a, uh, a fund. I would, I would create a fund with limited no, uh, amount of money, as you say, I mean, to, to, to uh, get it started. I would celebrate. I would celebrate success. And um, I would uh, provide flexibility to the, uh, to the investors, especially the pension funds. For example, today in Peru, specifically, um, the pension funds have 1% uh, total discretion to uh, invest in wacky type of investments. Mm -hmm. And up to 10%, depending on, uh, depending on how, how wacky you get, it will be 1% uh, or 10%. So I think those three, um, you can do uh, tax support as well. Um, uh, liberalize, uh, so, so take out all the, the, the burdens of, uh, of, of uh, setting up companies and, and, and the regulatory part. Uh, I would say that that's what I would do. Bueno. Closing down companies in Brazil. And closing down companies, a very good point to Very close good. down a company. And so, to open and to, yeah, so, but to run and to everything. As an <laughs> entrepreneur, when you realize, okay, I have to pivot my model and let go of this company and start a new one, you can be for five to six years trying to close down the previous venture. That's not conducive. So, good. I know I'll that, vote yeah. for him. I, yeah. <laughs> I know there are many more uh, questions, but we need to 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 finish the the, the panel. The panelists will stay here four or five more hours. At the, no, I feel you know, some time having a drink. So if you have any any specific question, you can address them uh, uh, outside. Thank you. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's freezing here. Thank no, no, you. no. It's a fire, <laughs> fireside chat. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alberto, Susana, Wilfredo. Thank, thank, thank you very much. It was a fantastic <laughs> panel.